Hello and welcome. Thanks. We have a great, great crowd today. Thank you all for coming. My name is Steve Slattery. I'm Executive Vice President at the Fund for American Studies. Welcome to those of you returning. This is our fourth lecture today. Uh, welcome the, for those of you who it's the first lecture today. Um, we've been doing this for 11 years with the Office of Senator Rand Paul, and it's a delight to be here. Our goal this year is to introduce you to courageous leaders who are challenging the status quo. We've already heard from a trailblazing journalist, um, an economist who uh, challenges the conventional wisdom, and Senator Paul, who takes on opponents both within his party and um, the other party. And today's speaker is, is also someone who's challenged her own party at great personal uh, risk and has even left her party on principle. So we're delighted that she can be here. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Einhorn Family Foundation. They've been our generous philanthropic sponsor for many years. They are the ones who uh, cover the expenses for this event, including the free lunches that we offer to all the students, which helps get these great crowds. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Rand Paul, our partner in this educational endeavor. Every day he's out there fighting the good fight for limited constitutional government, taking on the icons in Washington. He's even recently uh, referred Dr. Fauci for prosecution by DOJ for lying to Congress. So he's willing to take on those tough fights. And he works with us to come up with really exciting speakers every year to, to bring in front of you. So please welcome Senator Rand Paul. Great crowd, thanks for coming. So we are excited today. We have uh, four-term Congressman Tulsi Gabbard and 2020 presidential candidate. Uh, she's a combat veteran with three deployments to the Middle East and Africa. She currently serves as a Lieutenant Colonel. So we'll have to salute her and take orders. She uh, also hosts the Society and Culture podcast, The Tulsi Gabbard Show. Tulsi first served in elective office in the Hawaii State House of Representatives when she was about your age, she was 21. Due to the attacks on 9-11, she enlisted in the Army National Guard. In 2004, she gave up an easy re-election campaign and volunteered to deploy to Iraq with the 29th Brigade Combat Team, where she served in a medical unit. Having experienced firsthand the true cost of war, Tulsi ran for the U.S. Congress at age 31, vowing to honor the lives and sacrifice of her brothers and sisters in uniform. We're going a run for re-election. She ran uh, for president and as a and for the nomination of the Democrat Party in 2022. In 2022, later, she left the Democrat Party and can now be seen as a commentator on cable news. She has a new book coming out, For Love of Country, Why I Left the Democrat Party. Please give a warm welcome to Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you very much, Senator Paul. It is great to see all of you here. Thank you for making the time to come out. First and foremost, as we say in Hawaii, aloha. Aloha does not mean hello, first of all. Uh, it is a powerful word that means I come to you with respect. Uh, the traditional Native Hawaiian greeting of aloha um, allows us to break through all of the other barriers that tend to get in the way of having real dialogue and real conversation based on that recognition that we are all connected, regardless of race, religion, politics, or any of these other things, is allowed to see each other as people, as spirit, as children of God. That's why people in Hawaii greet each other in that way, and the traditional greeting is to stand together hands on each other's shoulders, foreheads and noses touching, you close your eyes and you just share a breath, recognizing that commonality that we all have. I worked in Washington first in uh, 2008, sorry, 2006 for Senator Akaka. I was a legislative aide, uh, so it's, it's funny and brings back a lot of memories walking through these halls, but it was a very different time then. Uh, obviously, there was still partisanship. There was still 
strong opposition on both sides, but there was a sense of statesmanship, and my former boss, Senator Akaka, was somebody who uh, really embodied that spirit of aloha, somebody who's been an inspiration and, and a mentor to me. And I start with that because of where we are right now, not only here in Washington, but as a country, where that basic sense of respect, of being able to, to have a, a civil conversation, to be able to listen to each other, and walk away maybe continuing to disagree on everything or maybe perhaps finding one thing that you have in common. This is becoming more and more rare to the point now where, as we all know, words are violence and if you say something that someone else disagrees with or is offended by, they call for your censorship or for you to be silenced. This is a pretty dangerous place for us to be in this country this country where we are known around the world as being that beacon of freedom. And unfortunately, that light is flickering. Um, who's here that I met in the airport in Memphis the other day? There you are. <laughs> um, you said something that, that, that happens a lot. You, we, you're very nice to come up and say hello as, as you're about to get on the plane. Um, but you said, you know, Tulsi, I really like you, but you know, even if we don't agree on everything, I think you're, you're awesome, something like that. Um, but I, I get that a lot from people. We don't agree on everything, but. And what I often tell people is, why, why do we need that disclaimer? It would suck if we all agreed on everything. We would all be walking around like robots, not thinking for ourselves, being critical thinkers, thinking independently about different issues, and knowing, hey, even if I disagree with you on something, doesn't mean I hate you. Doesn't mean I think you're a monster, it just means I disagree. I have a different experience that has informed my worldview, perhaps, than yours. It allows us to have these conversations where not only are we able to personally grow and learn, as we should throughout our lives, but especially in the world that all of you are working in now, we're able to find better solutions to serve the American people. And, and that's... That's really what it's about, and that's what I'm spending most of my time on these days, is traveling around and having these kinds of conversations with people about what does freedom really mean? What was the founder's intent for our country? And where are the greatest threats to our freedom coming from? Those threats are coming from within, unfortunately. They're coming from those who are in positions of power who are seeking to silence and punish those who dare to challenge them. And of course, Senator Paul, you are at the forefront of many of those battles, and we appreciate so much how you use your platform and your voice to speak for so many. The issue of these fights is, is almost not really the point. The point is the reaction. Uh, through my experience in the military, my views on foreign policy have been very informed from uh, a place of first-hand knowledge, not only of the cost of war. I served in a medical unit during my first deployment in Iraq, and it changed everything. It changed everything. It, the, the very first thing that I did every day was go through a list, name by name, of every American service member in that country that was a casualty. Going through that list, for me, I served in a brigade of about 3,000 people, and I, I was looking to see, were any of our soldiers on that list? Where were they? Were they getting the care they needed? Did they need to be evacuated? Could they stay in country? There were too many of my brothers and sisters who didn't make that trip home with us. And so when I, when I am calling out first President Obama, 2013, I had been in Congress for roughly six months. The main reason that I ran for Congress was because on the backs of two deployments to the Middle East at that time, I saw there were too few people walking these halls who were standing up against the warmongers in Washington. Too few people standing up against the military industrial complex. Too few people were willing to ask the tough questions, not only of the politicians, or the secretary members, the secretary of defense and state and others, but also of the generals who come before these committees. Asking them the tough questions, 
of what are you trying to accomplish? You want to start a new war? What are you trying to accomplish? How does that serve the best interests of the American people? How does your action in starting a new war ensure the safety, security, and freedom of the American people? Those questions were not being asked. They certainly weren't being answered. And so many of these politicians from both parties were too easily willing to send my brothers and sisters in uniform into harm's way for interests that we didn't volunteer to put our lives on the line for. Six months into my first year in Congress, President Obama announced that he was going to come to Congress to seek authorization to go and start a regime change war in Syria. This was why I ran. I, sat, I had a seat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee at the time. And I remember it was during the August recess when that announcement was made. I was at home filling up the gas tank in my car. A woman, I had no idea who she was, she came up to me and she grabbed my arm. And she said, Tulsi, my son just came back from Iraq. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I can't reach him now because of what he has been through. And what President Obama wants to do now makes me fear that I will lose my son for good. Please, please, please don't allow this to happen. I came back, sat through the House Foreign Affairs Committee hearings, questioned then Secretary of State Kerry and the various officials that they brought before Congress to make their case. I shouldn't have been surprised, but they couldn't answer the most basic questions. When I asked, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? They said, well, you know, we want to just go in and deliver a punch in the gut. What do you, what do you mean? It's, we don't want to go in and decapitate. We don't want this to be a pinprick. We just want to go and deliver a message through a punch in the gut. And when I asked, well, how do you think they're going to respond to that? Well, we don't think they're going to respond. What would you do if someone came up to you and punched you in the gut? Just walk away? Bend the knee? What, what do you think is going to happen? So the point being, they, they, could, they had not done what should be done by anyone who recognizes the gravity and seriousness of war and the consequences that that come with it. So I, I wrote an op-ed after we went through all the hearings, I examined all the evidence, and I recognized this was a very, very bad idea for the country. Printed an op-ed saying exactly that. The next day I got a call from the White House. They weren't calling me to ask, well, tell us more about your concerns. We realize that you've got these experiences, and did we not answer all of your questions? None of that. They called me and said, how dare you? You're a Democrat from Hawaii, from the president's home state. How dare you challenge him and oppose him? That said everything that I needed to know. It wasn't about the issue. It wasn't about the substance and the seriousness of what they wanted the American people to sign off on. Their criticism of me was how dare I challenge their power. How dare I not fall in line with the personality cult or the party cult or whatever it was where they demand total loyalty or else. And that's much of what we're seeing now here today. It's much of what drove me to leave the Democratic Party. Because by demanding that total loyalty, by demanding that you will comply or else, they stand against the very foundations of what it means to be an American what it means when we represent the values of freedom. It's something that we cannot ever take for granted. You know, the ACLU used to be an organization that put themselves at risk to defend the most horrific, abhorrent voices in this country, but they did it because they believed in the First Amendment. The ACLU is a joke today. They will only stand up and protect voices that they agree with, who have speech that they find acceptable. This is the norm that's being created 
in many of our schools, in many of our communities, and certainly on many mainstream media news stations. And it will continue unless we exercise our rights and our freedoms and continue to push back against it and remind us and remind our leaders what this country is about and who we are. Yes, you might get a few bruises along the way. Yes, there will be counterattacks. I have been smeared by the most crazy, crazy baseless accusations that make you want to laugh if they weren't so effective. When I ran for president in 2020, Hillary Clinton famously said that the Russians were grooming me, that I was a Russian asset. And her accusation, again, without any uh, evidence or, or backing or, or anything whatsoever, it was, just a, it was a comment that she said. It was repeated over and over and over and over and over again by all of the people in the mainstream media, by people in the Democratic Party. And her reason for doing it was obvious. I understood why she was doing it. She was trying to undermine me and plant seeds of doubt in people's minds that maybe I was somebody that couldn't be trusted. Didn't matter that I'd served at that point almost 20 years in the military. Didn't matter that I was you know, an eight-year member of Congress on the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committees. Didn't matter that I attended you know, high-level class. None of those things mattered. She wanted to plant that seed of doubt so that people would look at me a little askance and say, gosh, I don't know if we can trust her. And it worked. I traveled to South Carolina shortly after uh, she had made that comment. And I remember it was a small Democrat County uh, meeting in rural South Carolina. There were about 50 people in this building that could only be des described as a shack with a, with a little barbecue joint next door. And so I went, and as a candidate running for president, I talked to them and made my, made my pitch to them for why I was running for president and stuck around after to meet, meet people. But the woman who was in charge, the county chair, she pulled me aside at the end of that meeting. She put her hands on my shoulders and I looked into her eyes and she was clearly upset. And she looked me in the eyes and she just said, Tulsi, I need to know one thing. Are you working for Putin? She was on the verge of tears. She was this really, really, I could tell had been eating away at her. And I looked her right back in the eyes and said, I'm willing to die for the United States of America and all that we hold dear. Does that answer your question? I could see the relief in her face and she said, I left that meeting sad, really sad and disheartened because I couldn't go and meet everybody else like her in the country who believe that crap that the media and Hillary Clinton and the Democrat, many of the, the leading Democrats, the Democrat elite were spewing. I certainly didn't have the hundreds of millions of dollars needed to combat their propaganda. But it made me sad because I realized if they can do this to me, they can do this to anybody, anywhere, anytime, to silence those who dare to challenge their power. I don't regret anything. The positions I have taken, the statements that I have made in challenging those who are abusing their power to serve their own selfish interests rather than the interests of the American people, even with the consequences that have come with it. Because if we, every one of us, no matter our background or, or you know, you might think, well, I'm nobody. Nobody's going to listen to me. Every single one of us has the power to influence and impact other people's lives. Every one of us has the power to shape the direction for this country. If we are not willing to take a stand and defend what we love about this country, even if it means enduring a few punches to the face, what are we really doing here? Then we're not being honest with ourselves about what we're committed to. 
don't let anyone tell you that you don't matter. Don't let anyone tell you, well, hey, you know, you're, you know, I get it. You want to do good things in the country and, and in the world. Just wait 20 years because then maybe we'll take you seriously. I don't care how old you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care your position or your status in life. You have more power in your hands and your voice than you may realize. I have never been so concerned about where our country is headed than I am now, in a fundamental way, ever. Now is the time that we have to, every one of us, do our part to make sure that our country goes back to its roots, that we fulfill, fulfill the vision that our founders had for us, and save this country. Because if we don't do it, nobody will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, got some time for a few questions. Got some microphones walking around. Um, yes, start with you. First of, all, first of all, thank you so much for being here. It's kind of a surreal experience. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, my name is Gaurav Chintamidi. I go to Chapman University in Southern California. I was supposed to go to Chapman. Oh, really? Brief sidebar. I, I was going to go to Chapman, got accepted. The whole deal was packing the bags, getting ready to go. Almost financial aid fell through, and uh, I didn't want to go into debt to go to school, so I went to community college instead. It's a great school, though. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, loving it there, you know, it's been a good experience so far. Um, my question for you is, obviously, we live in a very polarized nation, super politically divided. What are you doing as a politician in order to bring both sides together, and what can other politicians do as well to mitigate the division in our country? This, this is a very important question. And frankly, it's just about being willing to engage with each other. Uh, it's something that, that I've always done. Shor shortly after I got to Congress, um, I saw immediately in our freshman class how for the first couple of weeks during orientation, you know, they bring you in and you go to these different policy retreats and you kind of get, you know, a little bit smarter on uh, all of the issues that we've got to cover. But then after that period, there was a clear bifurcation where Republicans went one way and Democrats went the other. And both of us got messages from within our parties like, okay, now it's time for you to be a good team player and do what we tell you to do. And one of those things was, we don't want you working with Republicans who uh, may be in a, a swing state because of we're, we're trying hard to beat them. And if you pass legislation with them, then you allow them to go back to the district and say, hey, look, I can work with people across the aisle to actually get things done. Democratic Party leaders said, we can't have that because then you're going to help them and it'll make it harder for us to win this seat. I made it, I made it a point to do my very best to get Republican co-sponsorship on, on every piece of legislation that I introduced. Uh, wasn't always able to do it, but it was, it was uh, a, a goal that I had for every, every single bill and building those relationships matters and they helped me better be effective for my constituents in Hawaii. Uh, I went back home, I think it was the first August recess that we had, and was doing little community meetings all across the state. My, my district had every island in the state. And uh, there was a, a local guy who came and pulled me aside after one of our town hall meetings. And he said, Tulsi, I love you. I think you're great. You're doing such great work. You're exactly where we want you to be. I only have one problem. You got to stop working with those Republicans. And I kind of laughed because he was thinking in the mindset that the Democratic Party leaders were thinking of, rather than in recognizing I had been able to be effective. The Republicans controlled the House at that time. I'd been able to be effective in passing legislation because of those relationships. So, you know, ultimately it's, it's about being willing. I started talking about Aloha. It's about being willing to, um, to engage with to listen to and to work with those who may not agree on everything, but those who have a heart for our country, knowing that 
I guarantee you, you're going to find at least one thing you can say that on. Hi, uh, my name is Julia Canty. I'm a rising senior at Ball State University in Indiana. Um, I wanted to ask you, as a woman in Washington, um, how have you remained so resilient in this opposition that you describe? And what advice do you have for us in fighting this good fight for kind of the freedom and the fundamental rights that we have? Whether you are a woman or a racial or religious uh, minority, um, if you are grounded in who you are and your purpose, stay focused on that and don't allow others who may, uh, who others who may have perceptions of you based on those other things to get in the way of your accomplishing your goal. Their perceptions, if they are negative, if they're saying, oh, well, you're a woman, so you can't do this, or you shouldn't do that, that's their problem, not yours. And focusing on what you can control, which is how you carry yourself, the work that you do, the, the uh, accomplishments that you're able to bring to the table, the value that you bring to whatever your team is or whatever your effort is, those are the things that you can control. Doesn't Usually people who have problems with others based on superficial things are really exposing their own insecurities. Let them deal with that. And in the process of you staying focused on your purpose, uh, you will do more to help maybe disprove their negative perceptions, but you will do more to help those who will come after you by being, hey God, you know, I, what was your name again? Julia. I worked with Julia and she was fantastic and she's smart, and she was all of these different things. So the next time another young woman walks through the door, they will remember you to be like, I'm looking for the next Julia. Are you it? Focus on what you're doing. Let all the naysayers uh, sit in the dark. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Kieran. I am a rising senior at Rutgers University studying economics and political science. And I just had a question regarding uh, third parties in American politics. So recently, the organization No Labels has been making the news for trying to, for considering running a third party candidate to uh, the Democrats and Republicans. And recently, Cornel West has also announced that he is running for president yep. through the third party. And so many uh, people are concerned that if, um, these third party candidates get enough traction that it could lead to a potential boiler effect and cause their ideological side to lose. So how do we best combat the two party duopoly even with, even with this fear of a potential spoiler effect if they think we left the Democratic Party and frequently call out this two party duopoly? Yeah, great question. This is something that's obviously been coming up a lot in the last few days. Uh, I went and I, I walked back here because I wanted to find this quote that I pulled last night. Uh, from John Adams, and I want to mention it because um, I heard someone on MSNBC the, the other day in response to exactly what you're talking about uh, and who you're talking about, RFK Jr. and Cornell West and No Labels and the Democrat elite feel threatened from all sides, uh, concerned that any one or all of these people will, will uh, be the quote-unquote spoiler for uh, for President Biden. And so anyway, so a, a, a staunch Democrat on MSNBC said something along the lines of, we have to fight to maintain two-party control and protect these institutions. It's crazy. The whole thing, the whole context, the person, the message, everything about that made, made no sense to me. But it caused me to go back and look at John Adams' quote when he warned us that, quote, a division of the republic into two great parties is to be dreaded as the great political evil. People need to be reminded of that, that we don't have to accept this narrative that these two parties have imposed on us, not because they care about our democracy, not because they care about us as voters being able to 
have great candidates to be able to choose from, but because they're trying to protect their own power. And so they have the arrogance and audacity to say, well, anybody like RFK Jr. who's running as a Democrat, or Cornell West who's running under the Green Party, or no labels who's actually trying to create a third option for people, how dare they because they will be a spoiler. Who the hell are they to say, what, pre President Biden's a spoiler because he's spoiling our rights as voters to be able to have other options to consider. He refuses to debate uh, RFK Jr. Maybe he's spoiling our ability to make the choice. So they're entitled and they believe that, that because he's the President of the United States and he's the incumbent, that therefore he just deserves to be able to walk through the door and we as voters don't even have a choice. There's more and more interest across the country in uh, people verbalizing that we want options as voters and that we are being failed by the two-party system. Uh, and so we need, we need more of that and more of, of not just accepting the narrative, well, hey, if you, if you support any of these other candidates, then you're just allowing Donald Trump to win or you're just allowing President Biden to win or whoever, because both parties have, have uh, cre helped to create and sustain this situation uh, and they use their power as leverage to make us believe that we have to make a choice that we're not excited about making and we don't really want to make, but we need to do so out of fear of the other. It's really sad that in our, my lifetime at least, I can't, there, there, we have lost the idea of people being excited to go to the polling place and cast your vote because you are excited and inspired by the candidate of your choice. And we live instead of in this world of, of a false choice between bad or worse. So, you know, we, we've got to keep making noise about this and uh, let them know we're not gonna, we're not gonna accept it. Michael, I'm a senior at the University of Wyoming. At the beginning of your speech, you talked about the military industrial complex, and for me, that's one of my biggest concerns as well. In your opinion, what do we do here as a country to combat the military industrial complex, and how do we also stand up to our foreign adversaries, such as China, and their increasing aggression across Asia, without potentially strengthening this military industrial complex and deepening the existing relationship with other countries? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, the power of, of the military industrial complex can't be underestimated. Um, what can we do about it? I mean, first and foremost, you know, the power that our founders gave us to ensure that our government exists with the consent of the governed is making good choices in who we vote for and recognizing, not, not buying into, um, you know, the campaign sees in lies, but, but actually paying attention to, on both parties, which, which of these representatives or, or senators are consistently voting for the wishes of the military industrial complex? Which of them are asking the tough questions on foreign policy? Uh, not, not only when it comes directly to the point of you know, uh, some kind of an act of war, but all of the stuff that happens on that pathway to war. Because once you get to that point where it's like, okay, should we launch some bombs or not? That's kind of the end of the line when it comes to the path to war. There's a lot that goes into creating the stage uh, for that to happen. So it's holding our leaders accountable. And it's not that hard to do, to see who in these halls continuously, many for decades, beating the drums for war. That's the first thing. I love it, there's so many questions. Um, strength, peace through strength works. Uh, I'm not an isolationist nor do I, and I, I serve in the military. I understand the need for us to continue to have a strong and capable, ready military um, prepared to defend safety, security, and freedom of the American people. 
if you go back and, and re-listen re to or reread uh, President Kennedy's speech to American University, he lays down how we can best achieve peace and prosperity while being pragmatic about how we deal with adversaries or those who we may agree with on some things and disagree with on others in order to maintain the peace. There has to be a very pragmatic approach. We have to live in the world that we live in, put ourselves in other shoes, and he talks about this in that speech, is we have to understand why are they doing what they're doing? We can't just sit in our ivory tower and just say, well, we're the greatest, we're the most powerful, and everyone must bow to our wishes and do whatever we want us, whatever we tell them to do. It's not how people work. And so by understanding the world that we live in, by understanding what motivates leaders of other countries, why are they coming at us the way they are, looking at history, again, the path to war is long. And when you follow that thread, you can then start to get to a place where you can take a strong diplomatic path forward to resolve whatever conflict may be there and prevent war, and also know that we will maintain the greatest military in the world to have at our fingertips once we have exhausted all diplomatic means and see war as the last resort to defend that safety, security, and freedom. Uh, we'll go in the back there. Hi, uh, my name is Jacqueline Burris. I want to thank you for coming to speak today. Um, I'm a junior at Texas State University down near Austin. I'm studying history and journalism. Um, my question, back in 2020 time period, before COVID, I was a big Andrew Yang supporter and I helped out with his campaign a bit. So I saw a lot yeah. of what the establishment was trying to do. Um, so I was just kind of curious. I don't disagree with third party at all. I think it's a great idea. But for Democrats who don't want to leave the party, what do you think is the best way forward worth working within? I mean... You know, I think, I think RFK Jr.'s candidacy uh, provides Democrats with an option that is, I don't think there, there could be a greater contrast uh, than between him and, and President uh, Joe Biden. Um, I think, we, and, and I, you know, Andrew and I, in many ways, were, were pushing the envelope of that within the Democratic primary in 2020 more than any other candidate. The, the, the rest were, were pretty much establishment Democrats you couldn't tell much difference between one from the other. Um, but again, it's pushing back against that narrative that we faced so often, which was, hey, Tulsi, I really, really like you, but I don't know if you can win. And this was like 16 months before the election. And that was often the, the thing, because they had been told, like, hey, if you support this other person, they're not a viable candidate, you shouldn't take them seriously, which is what they're doing to RFK right now, trying to cut off you know, the legs of the campaign long before voters even have a chance to go to the polls. So voters start thinking, well, gosh, you know, I really want to make sure that, that my party wins, that we get our best candidate to the forefront. Um, it's, it's, it's seeding our power, that argument seeds our power to the party. Well, then the party and the media then get to tell you, well, here's, here's the people who we think are viable. And that's exactly what happened in 2020, was they, they, they decided behind the curtains, well, here's the candidates that we deem acceptable. Everybody else we're going to try to, you know, smear or silence or not cover or not talk about in news articles in Texas. I went to a forum called She the People. There were a number of women who were running for president at the time, and there were a lot of issues important to women. And so this forum was called She the People. I went and I participated. And uh, the Washington Post did an article covering the event. They didn't mention that I was there at all. And so my press secretary called them. They're like, uh, hey, I don't know if this was a mistake. We knew it wasn't. But uh, Tulsi Gabbard was there. She is one of the women running for president right now. And it was written by one of their most seasoned, longtime political journalists. His name is escaping me right now. But he's, he literally said, we don't have to talk about her. We don't have to mention that she was there. So they weren't even trying to hide it. Um, for those who want 
are not ready to leave the Democrat Party for whatever reason, and I hold no judgment towards anyone. These are independent decisions, but uh, don't allow yourself to be limited to your options. And I would say the same for the Republican Party. There are a number of different Republicans running for president. Hold their feet to the fire. Ask them the tough questions. There, there are a number of them who you could change their appearance, appearance and get the same words and the same talking points. There are a lot of really important issues that we're facing and uh, not, not allowing someone else to decide for us who we're allowed to choose from is where we should start. Yes. Jacob from Senator Crapo's office. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, this is kind of like not what they're asking, like what's next for you? Like what do you, like are you thinking of getting back into political office or what would you say is next? Uh, the short answer to that is I don't know. And it's, it's, a, it's a truly, truly honest answer. Um, I have, when I first ran for office in Hawaii, when I was 21, I ran for the state house. And uh, I'll, I'll just brief sidebar on that, given, given you may be thinking about what you wanna do next in your life. Uh, I, it was an open seat, there, it was a five-way democratic primary, and um, a lot of people wrote me off because of my age. I didn't have a college degree at the time, uh, I came with a great passion for the environment and a desire to serve my community, and that's, that's what I brought to the table. And a lot of people said, you're too young, you don't have all of these resume bullets filled out, you shouldn't even be here. Well, I spent the next nine months knocking on every single door in my district, three times, talking to voters, sharing with them why I was doing what I was doing, and uh, I won that five-way Democratic primary and went on to the general election where the Republican candidate was a private practice physician. He put out a flyer that had a, a comparison sheet of all of his qualifications and mine. His list was very long and on mine he had a picture of me and it just said 21 years old. And he was passing that flyer out everywhere he went and boy, he was confident. He was so confident he was gonna win because this 21-year-old girl, who does she think she is? I forget what the numbers were, but I definitely beat him by over 60%. Even then, not once in my mind did I think, well, this is gonna be the great first step to a long and illustrious political career. I left after serving one term and volunteered to deploy to Iraq. My goal has never and still is not what office can I hold, but it is how best can I be of service. And uh, in doing so, um, all options are on the table. I don't know yet what's next in that sense, but I'm gonna continue doing what I'm doing and doing what I can to try to defend our country and our freedom. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, Celebrina Lopez, uh, studying at Texas State University. How have your time and service contributed to your understanding of ethical leadership and courageous leadership? Thank you. That's an important question. Because, because I, um, because I didn't get involved with politics out of a desire to be a politician, um, I have been and remain very firmly rooted in, in my why. And being rooted in that purpose, that desire for me personally to, to do my best to live a life in service to God and in service to others uh, gives me that foundation with a very strong North Star. Coupled with experiences both in the military and in politics of unethical leaders, toxic leaders, people who are willing to compromise um, the most important things to, to serve themselves and their ambitions, um, has not only given me clarity in what right looks like and what wrong looks like, 
but also has only further increased my own passion and commitment um, to do my best to There, there's a saying, I don't, I don't know the origin of this saying, but I've heard it a lot in the military that we all have choices that we can make every day between uh, the easy wrong or the hard right. And so those right decisions, those ethical decisions often require courage and they may come along with you not being as popular as maybe you once were or people not wanting to associate with you because you're not willing to kind of let these things uh, slide or look the other way when something wrong is, is happening. Um, and that does, it's, it's hard. It, it, it does require courage. But when you know your purpose and, and why you're there, that you're not there to uh, gain the approval, for example, of your colleagues or people in the media, remember who you're charged to serve, then uh, I'm not going to say it, it makes it easy, but it makes those choices clear. Thank you. Okay, last question. Yes. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. O Kanani ana ole e lele o Kalani ka uli noa. My name is Kanani. I'm from Hawaii. And I'm just so thankful to be able to talk to you today. Um, I wanted to ask you, as a Republican in a predominantly Democrat to a far left state, how do you recommend that we have civil discourse with those who may not share the same perspectives as us without also compromising on our own values? Can I ask you a question? How, how um, have you had any experiences at back home in Hawaii where you've, you've personally experienced kind of that difficulty? Yeah. Um, thank you, and aloha, nice to see you. Always, always coming from a place of love and respect is most important. Um, but knowing, unfortunately, that sometimes um, other people may not be coming from the same place, and their disagreement may cause them to not want to associate with you anymore. Uh, my dad has six brothers and one sister, and his one sister no longer talks to him or me or our family uh, because of her political differences. She went so far as during my re-election to Congress and my, my campaign for the presidency to dedicate all of her time and energy to trying to destroy me publicly. Uh, we weren't particularly close, but she created this narrative of something how she knew exactly what was in my heart in order to, to make uh, her voice heard. It made me really sad that she would dedicate her time to do this, but there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot I could do about it, and the relationship has been destroyed. Um, there are other examples I could give, give you of that. For, for people who... Well, for people who put their politics before everything else, um, un that's an unfortunate cost. It's real. But for others who uh, can recognize that your intent is coming from a place of caring for people, caring for our aina, our home, our land, caring for our future, then you can have robust conversations that can lead to a place where, again, Maybe it is the environment. Maybe it is about the protection of our oceans and, and clean water and clean air. That's a hard thing, that's a hard thing to disagree on. Uh, and there are other things, but I would, I would encourage you to find that one thing. And I'll close with this last little story um, because I think it illustrates what, what you're talking about. Uh, when I was campaigning, it was a small, small, I don't know, 1,200 population sized town in Iowa and there were probably five Democrats in the whole town, but I'd made a commitment to go and visit all of these different places, and in each place, I always tried to meet with the local, you know, newspaper editor or the local radio station or whatever. And so in this case, the, the publisher of that, that local newspaper uh, 
very, very, very staunch Republican, hardcore conservative. And the county chair, the Democrat county chair, was about uh, uh, 25 years old, and he was walking me around the town, which is literally one block, and he said, I just gotta warn you, you're gonna go in and talk to this guy, and he's gonna wanna pick a fight with you. It's like, okay, thanks for the heads up, appreciate it. Went in and uh, started a conversation, and he was definitely rearing for a fight. And he was all juiced up and energized because, you know, this is gonna be fun in his eyes. But instead of saying, all right, let's go on politics and let's joust each other based on policy, I just started asking him questions about himself and his family. And, you know, uh, where did they come from? The thing he wanted to fight me on was climate change. But as we started talking, I asked him questions about farming. I don't come from a farming family. I wanted to learn more. And long story short, we got to a place where we both agreed how important it is to protect the quality of our soil make it so that farmers can farm, how we need to uh, not allow these multinational agriculture corporations and the agriculture industrial complex to come in and ruin the livelihood of people who've been farming for generations, which his family had been. The need for clean water, the need to be able to protect our environment. We walked out recognizing that, sure, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you we disagreed on a bunch of things. But we found that common ground, not because of buzzwords that are being used by the politicians, but because of a shared appreciation for something that was important to us both. So as you're having those conversations, uh, as challenging as they can sometimes be, try to be the person who's, who's um, uh, looking for that, that common ground and focusing on people rather than politics, which is why we do what we do, uh, rather than somebody who's, who's igniting fire. And if still all, they, they're not interested in hearing, Aloha. I love you, care about you. See you next time. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your time. Great to see you today.